And we are live. My name is Paolo Javier, and I'm a poet and the program director of Poets House, wishing you all the best and sincerely hoping you're keeping safe indoors and out. This is Poets House live streaming, and I'm so grateful that you could join us tonight. Poets House is with you in solidarity. Tonight's broadcast is but one of the ways that we aim to support the poetic voice that is deep within us all. In this time when national borders are being enforced with even greater urgency and alarm, I am so pleased to be welcoming our guest this evening, poet, sound artist, performer, Caroline Bergvall, whose intermedia work spans checkpoints, gates, and boundaries, national histories, cultural memories, and literary centuries. Bergvall's talk tonight will cover the ways in which she works with medieval texts in her own interdisciplinary and multilingual writings. The poet will consider Chaucer's The Wife of Bath's Tale and her wide-ranging feminist and queer reimagining of the character in her recent book-length poem, Alison Sings, the conclusion to a trilogy of books that, at the very least, seek to meddle with the English language. Caroline, welcome to Poets House Live. Yes, I'm uh, coming in from Norway, the um, southeastern coast of Norway, where I take refuge when I can into this in this rather splendid family home because you know at the moment we are allowed to travel and um, and therefore find some some peace and space uh, in in outside of the cities the first idea when we were when we were talking Paolo about this talk when we were talking face to face in a cafe in New York there was very much the idea of thinking about the ballad form which was a season that you've been uh, hosting. And that's been a little bit, not my starting point because I never get to it, but it has very much been the way I have been thinking about this presentation, this short presentation for you. And I think it does make sense really um, because of my interest in sound, my interest in performance, my interest in sounding language. But it was still a point of discovery for me to be now, in a lot of my performances, nearly singing. So nearly bringing song, melodic speech, if you like, to my performances. As a poet, as a contemporary poet, I've sort of always resisted the breaking into song, which actually would break my, for many, for many years would break my poetic discipline or the poetic rigors that I were looking out of the, out of the work that I was doing. And now on the contrary, to break into song, to seek the song, not necessarily with my voice, as I'll be showing, is something that I find very enriching and very troubling, of course, because when you sing, you often can no longer hear speech. There's always that wonderful uh, dilemma about singing for um, semantics, if you like, or for making, making sense outside of the voice. And yet I see it as a coming together, this moving into song, and I'll describe it in the way that I use it. For me, it's a way of investing my different approaches, both with sight, spaces, so the resonance of space, how a space, how a sight sings. And also the way I'm working increasingly directly with poets, musicians, singers, people that I call language workers and to bring their voices through the impact of recording technologies into my performances. It is a way of bringing a type of song to my performances. I'm also working very directly at the moment with a composer. So I'm also writing a song or song structure that will be sung. So all these are sort of ways of rethinking the way I'm handling the poetic and the way I'm handling linguistic material. I would say in a more and more integrated way. But of course, we also know how print in many ways brought a silence to the archaic ancient form of the song of the recited Poetry. I'm making a very, very broad statement, of course. Um, but this idea of the graphic sounding would be a wrong word, actually. The graphic presencing 
or for example, concrete poetry or calligraphy, the beautiful gestures of calligraphy, has also sometimes separated the integrator, the performative aspect of, of, of song from the poetic, as we know. So to find myself coming to song through this book and yet also through my through the work that I do around the book is really very exciting and as I said a bit of a discovery a bit of an allowing something else to happen with my practice as a poet which is not only to acknowledge the interest that I have in the performative, the performativity of the page, the performativity of the way I handle languages, but actually also in the voicing, allowing for nearly no longer the break, but the sort of nearly perhaps, I wouldn't say healing into song, but certainly reaching towards song. And ironically, or ironically, this comes through with my book in the title of my current book, Alison Sings, which is my take on Chaucer's Wife of Bath. It is the final volume of a trilogy of works that started with Middle English and was followed on by Drift, in which I look at the Anglo-Saxon of the seafarer and contemporary sea migrants, uh, disasters, catastrophes. And then ends here with Alison Sings, ends here with the title that carries that word that I've been struggling with for so many years. The point of singing is double, is to sing and is to sing the way I use it in the title. So it's to sing as in to put melody on a text or around a letter. But it's also to praise others. That could be singular, that could be many. And of course we know the role of commissioned praise poetry in medieval literature to patrons to stay in their good graces, to sing their praises. I'm interested in song in both senses because Alison, this wonderful, I call a loud-mouthed proto-feminist character who goes on this pilgrimage wearing her Sunday clothes, who fights her battle verbally as a woman who is making her life and making her mark best she can. In a way, she doesn't sing. You know, she's a tale. And in true medieval fashion, but also in true Chaucerian fashion, she speaks and speaks and tells many stories to defend her point of view, to establish her presence. So it's through speech that she exists, not through song. And yet, the way it's placed on the cover, Alison sings Caroline Bergval, the way that was done by the designer, for me, made even more sense of using that idea of the singing of Alison and the way that figure has forced me to speak an enormous amount through that figure about all sorts of historical literary, fictional ways of handling gender roles, gender representation, the metamorphosis, the Ovidian metamorphosis, the blurring of boundaries between the animal, the vegetal and the human world that we find in the ancient world that I use Alison and that medieval period where that was still felt also through magic to allow for that to be an aspect of an imagination that tried to sing. I first imagined Alison when I was reading Christa Wolff's, the Eastern German writer Christa Wolff's, Medea. There was a small pamphlet that came out through Belladonna, which was really the first incentive to Alison Sings, that used that quote, if you like, as my epigraph uh, to the story. And I think it still makes so much sense um, I have now subsumed it into the new volume, but let me read you this wonderful quote from Christa Wolff. Do we let ourselves go back to the ancients or do they catch up with us? No matter. An outstretched hand suffices. Lightly they cross over to us, our strange guests who are like ourselves. 
We hold the key that unlocks all epochs. Sometimes we use it shamelessly, darting a hasty glimpse through the crack of the door, keen on quick, ready-made judgments. Yet it should also be possible to get closer, a step at a time, awed by the taboo, unwilling without great need to wrest away a secret from the dead. Confessing our need, we should begin with that. This theme of multiple voices that cross times through us into us, where the past might be facing the future, and the present is always a spiral of conflicting moments of the past. It's a clash and it's a spiraling. And like the medievalist Claire Lees puts it, the contemporary medieval is to have a conversation about the past where one can hold medieval and modern in flux and reciprocity where the past and present source each other, where the medieval and the modern interact, flow, pass, cross. A poetic project made in parts of a transhistoric and a multilingual vocabulary and imagined dialects might function as a kind of associative bridging to these linguistic and historic or imagined historical realities. There was a, a very strong sense in me on how to model that voice of Alison from this strange, this push and pull between the clashing of times, but also the endless spiraling and how they inform each other and one another and remake one another. And how there is no forward, it's all a spiral. The forward is the inscribed future. The forward is already past. It's a future that is only made of the past and we are exactly in it now, all of us. So I wanted to think of a voice that could traverse in that, in, in, with the richness and the pleasure of languages and histories and tales using strong phonetic spellings as part of the poetic voice that I developed, but also dystopic imaginary, and like I was saying, metamorphic imaginaries, to transform towards new re-engendered speak in such a way that it seems to indicate transhistoric emergence. Very much a sense of knowing that what we know of ourselves and of our time is really hardly the story at all. And of course, the politics of respelling, I've always found them as very strong impulses for many minoritarian and differential identity and poetics. I don't need to give you examples now, we might get to those, but you know, there, it is extraordinary how this letter-based, letter-based writings can affect so much powerful reimagining of the way we relate to each other and the way we set up each our identities and identities for each other. So to work with the historical in that transhistoric, fluid, spiraled way, for me, it's also a way of creating a palimpsest with the, con with the contemporary dormant within the past and dormant within these opened out acts of witnessings or acts of imaginary or, or acts of imagination. We're thinking about Nubeze Phillips Zong witnessing what got away from the past through the present. And this leads, of course, to connected ways of thinking about current states of language and linguistic imaginations of identity translingual, bilingual poetics, internalized, the infra-traveling of the material letters might lead to a singing into a poem. 
Discourse on the Logic of Language by M. Nobese Philip. English is my mother tongue. A mother tongue is not a foreign. Lang, 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 language, language, anguish, a foreign, anguish. Its own language, not its own language, its own languages. Imagination of languages as dialects, as protest activity of reinvention. Palimpsestic. The way spelling will carry over long after its pronunciation has changed. And yet the early K of the Anglo-Saxon became the Norman C that replaces it. And then the African-American rap spelling of America with a K and a K and a K. Let me read you briefly what Alison says of the way I've invited or the way she handles language in Alison Sings. Not worry, should my language feeling it weirdo, rude and curious at first, rough as a cat's lick or like a dress, wet extravagant, folded over, up doubled, as though I'm speaking many languages at once. What's for sure? And many stories too in many gay apparel, because for serious, it is a rich scramble jumble of heavily cross-bedded bitching tongues, folded like shells in etymologic tension, and so is my usage, a happy combi mess, simpel. Sure, language is cool for tally and keeping accounts of deeds and misdeeds, and that's alrighty. It's changeable energy what's right enough for me, and no future academia can ever change the fact that my tongue is as agile with it as a French kiss or a sailing cog in the storm. I've got a trader's grammar, lover's declension. Indeed, my loins may stop a blader, but my love juice is out of this world. There. Has just begun to flow the banks, and when I speech like this, my thoughts and adventures, tis like I am ye sitting the lap of Sherazad, and she asks for it to be longer, to be louder. Now that's my whole megaphony. Mind the yow, these days, often wishing my weight of talent, can't prophesize like a Cassandra, provoke uprisings like a Boudicca, and run a molten lava all over this trumpy. I hope what's clarified it. No foolery. My words, my bond. My name's Alison. Dames Alison. So we're slowly getting to this idea of the ballad as a sort of holding form, perhaps, like I was saying, as a moving into a different space. And I just again wanted to share with you some because this, this idea of the song has brought me back to sort of intuitions around song. Perhaps because of when you think about song you have to think also about breath in a different way than you would in the way you think about punctuation, perhaps, on the page. And to think about breath is to enter a sort of anonymity. It is one's condition when one speaks, therefore one is alive, that one also has to stop and breathe. And that breath is the thing, the element, first of all, that we are all struggling with at the moment, but it is also therefore the element that binds us the most together. So to start to work with breath as part of song is really starting to meet something that I find very interesting for the contemporary practitioner, which is this idea of anonymity. Removing one's, perhaps not one's, anonymity would be perhaps to remove one's name, but it is also it's something to do with a bridging, a container, an invitation away from oneself. And I do it here through the figure of Alison. But I just wanted to share two thoughts that just meet that, that I was, that I came, that I remembered or that I found again when I was preparing this little intervention, um, which is in my opening essay from this trilogy, uh, called Middle English. And I'll come back to that because in many ways, Middle English does lead all the way into Alison. 
Again, the question of language, first of all, and language politics. To meddle with English is to be in the flux that abounds, the large surf of one's clouded contemporaneity. It's a process of social and mental excavation explored to a point of extremity, one that reaches for the irritated, excitable uncertainties of our embodied spoken lives by working with, taking apart, seeing through the imposed complicities of linguistic networks and cultural scaffolds. It means implicating one's life through the gestures and events of one's work. There is only so much one should want to do to pass, to be passable, to appear to belong to today. Anonymity of the writer, whose masks have fallen deeply into the pits and currents of language. Rebirth of the songer, Intense magnetism of lines that go through the body like radial songs. My personal sense of linguistic belonging was not created by showing for the best English I can speak or write, but the most flexible one, to make and irritate English at its epiderm and at my own. But to go back to the magnetism that goes through the body like radial songs. It is interesting, this idea of the, of the anonymity, if you think about the ballad. The medieval ballad, it was sort of usually a... And I, I put the ballad together with the broadside, and I will show you why. But the ballad was sort of narrative poems, quite simple, sung to one solo instrument. They were really for popular culture. They were recited, not, not written. And a lot of them have also found their way through the broadsides. So the broadsides that were developed nearly to circulate, not only ballads, but also daily news, like executions. And in a way, they took the place of the newspaper. They were the first sort of newspapers. They were also political pamphlets. And of course, all this continues into poetry publishing, as poetry publishing through mimeographs and broadsides of so much of poetic culture. So from the ballad to the distribution of poems and of poetic culture. Now, as part of Metal English, I was on the side of that, I was developing my first installation called Middling English. This is in 2010. And in that, I was starting to really try and work with contemporary so I was working with the DJ, for example, but I was also working my Chaucer texts in the context of an installation. And so I developed a few broadsides, again, on very cheap, recyclable paper. Or well, one of these broadsides exists in Allison, but two of them I wanted to show you. So the first one that I want to show you is the one called The Fried Tale, because this was, at the time, the most ambitious handling that I did of trying to take on some of Chaucer's tales. And... I developed for it a language which is extremely dystopic. This is the tale of bankers during terrible times that we've had of the greed and the overinvestments. And I developed a language very much influenced by writers such as Ridley Walker or Anthony Burgess that have really been thinking about spelling and rethink and, and the sort of simplification of syntax as a sort of negative therefore sort of liberatory from the point of view of the reader, but negative narrative. I just want to read the beginning of this tale, which deals with two young bankers that are about to rob um, somebody else called a ninja. You might remember those terms from the banking world, banking crisis. All juice it with an ass full of mula, wonga, clams and squids, dust stuck in identical black cases hanging from their hands, Two suits, a mega pair of Smith, blue pills, no doubt, videoing how they're trading out of goodness, well stuperific, shake a handers, hug and abuse each other on the back. It's a total blowout. We're talking millions of squillions, zillions and nanillions, billions of terramillions just for creaming the topping. Oh, my brother. Both talk loudly in blinking ear pieces. Strapped in the same fashion, exactly grayly and likely, like gold knobs wanting to be dressed to a T, like a G and G. 
and on and on it goes to very, very dark terrain, using a lot of, um, again, that uh, very rich but very simplified, brutal language. And the other one I want to share with you is OSIS. That was a broadside that has made it into Alison, and this is where you see the connection uh, that I was trying to draw. It more or less closes Alison, whereas here it was one of the first broadsides that I devised. Some of the landscapes that you can see on these on on these two broadsides, you can just see here a little bit of a of a dark cloud. Um, is actually taken from some of the woodblocks of original broadsides. I went and did quite a lot of research around some of the illustrations that were uh, part of some of these broadsides and the accompanying ballads. Oh, sis. Oh, sis, sis. Yo, sis, sis, bro. Yo, bro, sis. Yay, sis, bro, sis. Yay, bro, sis, bro. Yo, bro, sis, bro, bro. Yeah, bro, bro, sis, bro, sis. Yeah, sis, sis. Yeah, sis, bro. Too many deals. Not enough daring. Too much lingo. Not enough tongue. Too much fear. Not enough fire. Not enough fire. But this is towards the very end of Alison sings. The current work I'm working on, which sort of is like as describing side by side with this long-standing writing of Alison that I've done, is nearly at the opposite end of that work in the sense that I invite, like I was describing briefly earlier, I invite poets, translators in conversation with me who have a language deemed minoritarian for a reason or another. And whether it's an ancient language or a new arrival language. And I ask them to translate phrases from this performance that I am working on. I then put all this together with a singer. I work with a composer and it is an outdoor sunrise performance. So we also get the dawn chorus of the birds. So you can see that this work takes us all the way through the breath of the human into, if you like, the natural surrounding ambient world of the early dawn outside. And I've just sort of put together a small clip which was from a rehearsal, very early rehearsal, where you'll see a couple of languages, a couple of speakers, one from Punjabi and the other one from Romansh, that are interacting with the work that I'm doing with the singer, literally on small uh, phonemic sounds. R and We and R Edges and J for this work, I use the term root phrases as the way I invite these different languages or different occurrences. Some of them are literally poetic works that I put together, but in this case, as you could hear, there some speakers with me. And the phrase that I invite them to think about and to translate is at the core of this outdoor performance. And it is the phrase, passengers we are, passages we are. I just want to close now by saying that the making sing of Alison sings enables an intensely mixed, mashed, meshed, written, spoken form, a multiplicity of references through a carnivalesque merging of registers and genders through all these methods and many others, I find that it is not a ballad, 
but it sings as many. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, wow. First of all, congratulations on your recent book. It's a conclusion to a trilogy of books that take as their focus medieval English or Middle English, which you meddle it. But from my consideration of your work, Alison Sings, to uh, ask you, how did you get to Alison Sings? Well, I had no idea uh, that Alison would become the project that it has become in the sense that it's been it it's been nearly seven years in a way where i've done been doing an enormous amount of other types of much more collaborative projects but where when i picked up again on this volume because i felt that the first occurrence of this voice of this figure was nearly like the wonderful sort of skeleton or the spine onto which i still needed to put up a lot of flesh and fat and um, that's why I decided to re-engage with this figure of Alison. And I've been doing it for the last two and a half years, at least now. It's been extremely demanding um, because, of course, it's also about um, identitarian politics uh, and how, how far into that I wanted to go. Uh, perhaps for the first time in explicit narrative ways that have followed through, uh, she goes, you know, she, Alison, as I was describing, you know, in, in my talk, uh, and as she's known, I think, by many as this iconic, uh, early, very early sort of compound feminist that uh, chose to put together. And I wanted to be thinking about it across, like I was describing this, this sort of spiral of times. And therefore for me, Alison needed to become an enormous amount of influences and voices that have in each their ways been thinking and therefore helping us all to reimagine gender, sexuality, and all the separations between, you know? Um, so it's it's been very demanding emotionally but it's also been extraordinary because, again, it is now, it, ha it forced me to open up to my process, basically. So I spent an enormous amount of time on the technical aspect of thinking about this language of Alison. How does she speak? You know, what do I use of Chaucer's own text? How do I set up the repetitions? All the, the technical joys that I have for, you know, just manipulating and playing with what I have, which is basically Chaucer's text. And then all the other materials that come around it. There's an enormous amount of languages and registers that are inside this book. Um, yeah, also perhaps just to say that, you know, I decided after many, many sort of thinking processes to present it as a book of poetic prose. So, so these are sort of very much poetic paragraphs in a way and short tales. Uh, that each have their little sort of header and title. And this allowed me to basically really put as much meat as I wanted to on that, on the shaping of that uh, maximalist figure of Alison, basically. Uh, and I did it for, because I really needed to be rethinking about my feminism and I needed to be rethinking about where we are with it. And I needed to be thinking about where we all are with it, with all the movements that have been taking place and all the violence that is still taking place. So there was that sense that that deep need to take part in that conversation and reaffirm where I am with it and uh, and and how as a poet, I'm, I might be able to to take it on. As someone who who's from uh, the Philippines, which is a country where English was violently assimilated into the country, meddling, troubling English, engaging in a hybrid English practice is like second nature to me. What I find really uh, captivating about Alison Sings, but the trilogy of books that starts with metal English, was your own proximity to English. Uh, you're of French Norwegian background, uh, but you are currently based, or maybe now formerly based for now, in the UK, the United Kingdom, and you are. Um, a visiting professor at King's College in the Medieval Studies program. And the uh, Filipino, Filipinex, North American experience with English is one thing. Uh, I would like to hear about your experience with English, you know, growing up 
uh, your evolution as a poet, uh, the choices you have in terms of languages, uh, multiple entry points for you in terms of language, and you know how has it been, how has it informed the research that has undergone this? It seems like a lot. Like for me, if I were to take on uh, medieval English, I were to take on the English language. Chaucer would be the more daunting task. <laughs> Shakespeare would be the more obvious, but I say Chaucer just because oh, um, yeah. the turn that English takes historically, it's such a tender, vulnerable moment in the language, but it's also a, an exciting record of this coming together of English from disparate parts. So maybe you could speak to this hybridity. Mm, absolutely. Chaucer was nearly more logical for me than Shakespeare because of it's a joke that has been made but that I really find really sort of uh, useful is in the sense that Middle English in many ways is still has an enormous amount of traces from the old English and yet it is very much dominated by the Normans so for me it is very much my French heritage and letting the Nordic my Norwegian heritage see through and find its resonances. So my English is from the start, when you look at it sort of from the point of view of historic languages and the way they have occupied and reshaped um, the British Isles or is actually very much the makeup that I come with. So in a way there was a sense of familiarity on reading um, Chaucer's uh, English, which I really appreciated um, also because of my own French literary studies, if you like, and my interest in medieval French uh, literature. So that's sort of one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is my needing quite early on in my writing life, if you know, in my life, perhaps I would say nearly to look for a language in which I could feel freer as a young gay woman. I needed to be able to um, invent a new connection for myself in a language that um, I needed to make available to that. So English being a sort of dominant vehicular language, one we get taught at school, uh, was nearly an obvious choice from where I, you know, come from, you know, having been brought up both in uh, in Central Europe and then also in uh, Norway, England is very much English is very much the main vehicular language you get taught at school, and there was always a proximity with English literature and of course American culture as we you know uh, had it through movies and all that. So that for me was a, the starting point. That that made sense. How can you adopt yourself into a language when you feel you have to? Uh, because I could not function fully in the French and the Norwegian of my familial background. And yet I sort of was interested not in becoming English, not in having a writing that was necessarily uh, claiming itself to be English, but really, and perhaps very much what you describe, Paolo, and what I see in so much poetry that I admire, especially also from America, really take on that it is by acknowledging the a refusal of standardization, a refusal of the dominant forms that also cancel us out for many different reasons with many different histories, but actually create a poetic universe in which the joins, the seams, the accidental, the traumatic are side by side, are there, exist, you know. And that's why I think my interest in the, the, the moving a development of English that happened so much in the medieval period has remained so, such an interesting sort of point of call for me uh, in my, you know, in, in so much of my, in so much of my work. And, you know, perhaps someone who's n new to your work uh, and not having read your work and perhaps they're not even familiar with Chaucer's work or have an interest in Chaucer's work would wonder to themselves, why would you in you know, 2020 uh, or the last eight years take an interest in medieval English and what does that have to do with today? Certainly in Alison Sings where you 
embrace the character, but not in um, the usual fictional sense. Um, but there are anachronisms in Allison Sings that are sure. deliberate and intentional. Uh, and someone coming into your work may wonder to themselves, well, what does, what could Chaucer have to do with today? And I'm mm. thinking about the arc of your your trilogy, starting with Metal English, which I suppose you can think of as a formal introduction to your your project. But you also see the um, the disruption happening in terms of the different formal play. And then in Drift, you have this very emotional uh, series of narratives uh, about migration. But then also you see the, the, an interest in cursive and handwriting in the forms that this changing language takes on the page. And then in Alison Sings, you actually have a more embodied uh, character that you're investigating. Um, and I'm also thinking about your mention of hip hop and rap, right? Uh, which in terms of the neoconservatives, right, the purists um, have been charging rappers and MCs for ruining English for the longest mm. time. But anyone with half a mind who studying the history of the English language will realize actually you see more a continuity in the Englishes that you see in these ballads and these rap songs with what Chaucer was attempting to do. Right. A very long question with many different points uh, that are all, of course, super interesting. I think the whole idea of the vernacular, my interest in the vernacular languages, um, the fact of medieval um, songs and medieval literature being written also to be shared uh, in direct, um, in, in, through, through sort of communal reading, I find very interesting. The world between, before print and how distribution was taking place then. Um, so for me, there's that. There's the idea of the communal, the role of poetry being ascribed also through that communal value, that communal function. Uh, so of course, it's also entertainment. And that I think is a super important part. I mean, it's something that's very important in my work. Um, and it may not be entertainment in the sense of, you know, um, but it's definitely entertainment in the sense of enjoyment of, uh, like you were mentioning rap. Well, there's a whole long song in, in, uh, in Alison Sings, which is made up of, it's a mashup of a lot of funk songs and pop songs. Um, and, um, you know, the, that sort of sense of wanting to have a lot of that co cohabitation of forms of poetry and of song and of, you know, um, yeah, sort of manifestations of current um, spoken forms uh, inside my work. So that's, I mean, I, that's a very important aspect of it. Always since the beginning of this work with Chaucer, what I discovered was how much I enjoyed the combination of a narrative, so a story told, with um, either the economy or the bombast, if you like, of the way one would handle the language, the telling of that tale. And that, for me, is also part of my interest in this early literature, the telling of the tale through which you also tell of the world. You know, there's a lot in Chaucer, which is these are moral tales as well. You know, they might not draw a final line of morality in the sense that they are also there, you know, with his humor, they very much explode some of those, but they really indicate different types of moral dilemmas of the time. So I find that a very, very interesting way of being engaged and being able to engage with some of my more experimental, you know, multilingual forms with narratives. And as soon as you put those two together, it sort of makes sense differently. You know, like it's a, it becomes a poetry that can live across so many different environments outside the book in recordings. Um, you know, very much, very much like rap. It's a poetry that exists as and in different forms, gets created also through performance. So I think all that is really, these are some of the models that I have followed, if you like, the model of the music culture, uh, the model of performance culture in relation to poet poetic activities, as much as my literary friends and, and you know, and, and poetic activities. And of course, it is part of contemporary poetry that, so many poets um, are engaging in 
the performativity of their time in this way, you know, as poets. You know. From that point of view, I feel very privileged and, you know, happy to be living now because these are the times where we are taking language apart to, to sort of reconstruct it, you know, with very different ideas. There's no sense of the one English or the one language, on the contrary, you know. Yeah. One of the things that struck me um, in your presentation was an articulation of the purpose of the ballad uh, in Chaucer's day. And I'm just reminded of Bob Dylan's recent number one song, which is like th a 13 to 16 minute track about the assassination of JFK and your point about the ballad actually serving as this inclusive experience, a place, uh, uh, a form to experience the art of song, of poetry, but also to share the news of the day. And um, you're at King's College, or you were at King's College. Is this Alison Singh's, in fact, the end of uh, your poetic research? Well, um, the the, the um, being part of King's um, as a practitioner researcher, if you like, has been wonderful, extremely uh, generous way of welcoming me as a practitioner who has a strong and researched interest in um, medieval forms of literature or medieval languages. So that's been so um, exciting to me. That really is that meeting point between practice and research and scholarly research and, pra and artistic practice. From that point of view, this is a sort of experiment that I think um, Claire Lees, who I mentioned earlier in my talk, and others um, have sort of been very sort of strong in London or you know within their scene to try and think through the contemporary uh, and contemporary practice as a way in. You know, so the past is like I was saying earlier, spiraling through. It is not sort of you know put away. Uh, in a dusty sort of medieval studies cupboard, if you like. So that would be one thing. Um, and the other thing is the the practice of song or of breath at the moment where we are all so separate and are breathing. <laughs> well, first of all, for example, in Germany at the moment where singing is banned, um, and what I find when I go online at the moment, especially perhaps Instagram, where a lot of informal meetings of poets are taking place is a lot of singing takes place. So to imagine that one reopens a country and one cannot sing, it really goes back to early sort of European um, divisiveness, Christian divisiveness. However, of course, you know, you, this is a slightly, it's a totally different reading of it and I could totally understand it. However, it was very interesting to me to be thinking about the banning of singing in relation to this. Um, last night, I was watching very late at night because the time zone is all wrong. So Nubesi was doing a performance of Zong and it lasted for about an hour. I mean, she got interrupted by the end of the Instagram uh, link and it was extraordinary. And I've, I've experienced quite a few poets and singers that are literally using Instagram, and I think we all do. And I find that really um, very interesting for practice because, again, we go back to something that is taking, in a way, the most, perhaps the most direct of some of our practices and then just putting them out there as something to share. And so I'm sort of very appreciative of that and how it forces us to be quite open with things that are unfinished. So I'm going to start doing, I have a few small short performances, you know, breathe, you know, I call them, I can't remember if I call them breath in words or words in breath, but these are sort of breathing and speaking performances that I've been doing for a few years. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue trying to put some out at the moment on Instagram as, you know, again, as a way of, of sharing through the, the, the forms, the, the social forms that we currently have to our, you know, at our disposal. It just reminds me of Absolutely. the value of the troop, the troubadour, the griot, right um the absolutely year uh, and um, absolutely i guess in this in this age of all these options technologically you know just having your voice at your disposal is plenty um technology absolutely. enough 
I yeah. Agree. yeah. Uh, you know, and that was one of the first thing that happened, wasn't it? Is that you realize, oh my God, what? So what's left of all this equipment we have, or what's left is the voice, and it's you know, and I, it's exactly right. It's how to re rekindle the simplicity and yet the the formal work with that, you know. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, but New Yorkers are New Yorkers, of course. There was footage about a month ago of someone attempting to sing on their balcony and. New Yorkers on the street just told them to be quiet. Um, <laughs> but uh, nightly, <laughs> nightly, my family and I have taken to, you know, clapping and cheering and singing to the efforts of all yeah. of our essential workers, uh, workers on the, on, on the farms and uh, healthcare yeah. workers. And uh, I hope um, I hope you're doing okay, you and your family is doing okay, Caroline. Thank you so much for being a part Thank of you so our, much, our season. This is just a start. Uh, everyone, please do check out uh, Allison Sings. Uh, so great hosting you, Caroline. Be safe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Take care. And that's our program for tonight. Everyone, please be safe. Be kind. I will see you next time. Take care. If you've enjoyed these programs, please consider giving a contribution to Poets House. For more than 30 years, they've kept the door wide open to everyone for the joy of poetry. Recently, they have temporarily had to shut the door and are reeling from the financial implications. Please give even a small donation if you can. Thank you.